I want to start up with one of the most significant things I can tell you about storytelling if you represent injured people. If it's a products case, if it's an automobile case, if it's a malpractice case. And this can also apply to some contract cases. It is a phenomenon that several of our uh, consultants, jury consultants and trial lawyers have witnessed and reported on in the last few years. And it is a psychological phenomenon uh, called attribution bias. And this is the way it works. When you are telling your story, you've laid out the rules of the road, you've set the scene, whatever you're picking, you're going to set the scene and introduce the characters. The most significant decision you will make as far as storytelling as far as opening statement is concerned. And it makes all the difference in the world. Is where do I begin the story? Where do I begin the story? And I have seen lawyers make this mistake over the years and fall so far behind because they began the story at the wrong place. They wanted to talk about they want to start talking about the empty room where the child used to live or how hard it was on the parents or they wanted to talk about what good people the parents were, whatever. Let me give you an example. I'll, uh, it's similar to an example that uh, David Ball likes to give. Mine's a, a little bit different original with me, but the concept's the same. Let's say you represent a lady Sarah. And Sarah has worked for 20 years at a large oil company in their division orders department. Getting division orders out every month. And Sarah is divorced. Her children are grown. She's living by herself now. And so she comes in every day at 9 o'clock. She is there. She's the most dependable employee you can imagine. And at 5, she leaves because she's always caught up on her work. And she drives about 20 minutes to work, 20 minutes. She doesn't live too far out in Houston. And she takes the same route home every day, and she takes the same route home the next, uh, to work the next day. But today, Sarah decides she's caught up on her work about 1 o'clock, and she says, you know, I've been working real hard. I haven't had any time off in a while. And you know what? I'm just going to go up to the outlet store up by Brenham. I'm just going to do some shopping. Find me some bargains. We all know how bargains turn women on. So I'm going to go find me some bargains. And so she takes off. She's caught up. She says, I could sit here and work till five and, and get some more work done, but I'm just going to take off, and I'm going to take off in the afternoon. So she takes off, and she's going to go up to Brennan, the outlet store. Well, she's getting out that way, and she thinks, well, you know, it's just my afternoon off. Instead of taking I-10, the quick way, I'm going to take the scenic route. I think I'll go the back way out 290, enjoy the scenery, take my time. I'm just going to, you know, go and see so she's going there. And then she, after a while, she said, you know, I think I'll, I think I'll just stop and get me a cup of coffee. And uh, she sees a McDonald's, and so I could pull through, as most people do, and pick up the coffee and just take it and drink it in the, in the car while I go on up to the outlet. But I'm not going to, I'm going to just pull over, and I'm going to go in, and I'm going to sit in McDonald's. And so she sits down in McDonald's, and she has her a cup of coffee, and she meets uh, some, one of the locals that has a little visit with them, just talking about, you know, the neighborhood and things they've built up. Well, she's in the coffee shop, probably 20, or McDonald's, 20, 25 minutes. She gets back in her car. And then as she's getting up close to the outlet center and she's approaching an intersection, 
the light turns yellow. Now she can go on through because she has the room for that, but she decides, thinks about it for a second. Uh, you know, I'm going through, no, I better stop. And then she comes to a control stop, and a second later, boom, an 18 wheeler crashes into the rear of her car. Now, what happens if you tell the story that way? I mean, here's a woman, rear ended, shouldn't be any question about fault, should there? But if you tell the story that way, what will happen is that your listeners will start saying, well, now, wait a minute. If she had just worked that day and not taken off, this accident wouldn't have happened. If she had not taken the scenic route up to the outlet, this accident wouldn't have happened. If she hadn't stopped for a cup of coffee, this accident wouldn't have happened. If she had gotten the coffee and driven instead of going inside and spending 25 minutes, this accident wouldn't have happened. If when she got to the yellow light, she'd gone on through, this accident wouldn't have happened. Before you know it, everybody is thinking of all the things your client did wrong. So, remember, the principal rule for us that represent citizens, individuals, working men and women, in our cases, is it is the defendant that is on trial. The defendant is on trial. That is why when I am putting on my plaintiff, I, number one, want them on the stand for as short a time as I can get by with. Now, I know that that is counterintuitive. You want your plaintiff on the stand a whole bunch, but you really don't. But when you're telling your story, start with the antagonist, the defendant. So in Sarah's case, you wouldn't start with, she was a good worker, she always did this, did that. You'd start with the trucking company. ABC Trucking Company runs a fleet of so many trucks and this day the driver had been on the road 10 hours before the accident happened, or this driver had had three moving traffic violations, or they don't check them, or whatever you've got that's going to help impose liability on the defendant. Start with the antagonist. Now here's another thing, maybe a little counterintuitive. When you are putting your client on, concentrate on the before, not the after. Talk about what the family was like before the injury. Talk about the happy family that existed before the person was killed. Talk about the happy family before the injuries. Concentrate on the before. Most plaintiff lawyers want to spend all the time talking about the after, but you want to talk about the before because you want to make that contrast really good. Second thing, do not use your plaintiff to talk about the after. Use family members, use neighbors, use everybody. You don't want your plaintiff talking about, oh boy, I'm hurting, I'm so bad, I'm so I have to, yeah, that comes across as a whiner. Third thing, when you're asking somebody about, you're trying to develop the character of your client, do it with stories. You know, I have seen lawyer after lawyer, they'll add, they've got their checklist. And they'll be sitting there and they'll, well, was in a death case. Was Sarah a good mother? Did she love her children? Was she a good wife? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jerry's sitting there, okay, so what? You don't do it that way. You have a witness on and so you've got a, you've got a client uh, somebody that's hurt or somebody that's dead and in your interviews with your client they say she was so helpful at work she was always helping us out you don't say was she helpful at work you say tell us about the time Sarah stayed late with you to get that project out let them tell the story tell us about that time you made the mistake at work and Sarah stepped in and took responsibility for it, even though it wasn't our responsibility. Tell us about that. 
So you do it with stories. You have your story, and then in your story, there are many other stories that you can tell. I don't care how smart you are at drafting questions or drafting cross-examination. If you focus on what you're asking or what you're saying, you will not be an effective examiner. It is all about nonverbal skills. Storytelling is all about nonverbal. You've got to have a good story, but you've got, as we've seen with the example of the two Kennedys, you have to capture the mood, you have to be able to show you're credible. When you are doing the direct examination, you are not the storyteller. Now, for some reason, lawyers are convinced that they've got to be the storyteller at every stage of trial. When you're doing the direct examination, you are not the storyteller. Your witness is. And because they are the storyteller and you want them to be the storyteller, you want the focus on your witness and everything you can do to get the focus on your witness. That's why when I'm preparing a witness for trial, I will go and sit with the witness and go over things we're going to cover, find out more things I need to find out. But I will always sit the witness in my office or my conference room. I will sit over here and I will bring one or two of my people to sit over here. And I will say, I'm going to be asking you some questions, but I want you to, I said, do you have a friend that just, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, when you get with them, they just never have anything to say? Oh, and everybody was, oh yeah, John's that way. I mean, you sit around, he doesn't have anything to say. I say, okay, I want you to consider that even though I'm asking the questions, I'm like John. What do you do when John's there and he doesn't have anything to say? You don't just ignore him. No, I look over at him. Well, the jury is like John. They don't have anything to say, but you've got to talk to them. So we work on question, answer, eye contact. Now, you don't want your witness sitting there staring at the jury the whole time. You're asking questions. And ask, yeah, that's right. No, that doesn't work. It's kind of like a video game, you know, one of those pong games. Bong, bong. Bong, bong. That's kind of what you want. Question. I understand the question. And the answer is, because I don't want to leave John out, here's part of the answer. And then, you know, you, you train them. You work with them. You get, them, uh, get used to talking to this person over here that is your silent friend. Because you want that jury making eye contact over here. And then get your client used to the fact of saying, now look, I'm going to ask you some questions, but I'm, I do not want a long narrative. So if I ask you something, I'll try to break it down so we don't get into a long narrative because let's face it, jurors do not like long narratives. They really don't from a witness. I mean, t tell us. What happened? Well, I got up that morning at 9 o'clock, and then I had breakfast at 9.30, and then, you know, this happened, then I got to work, and then I left to work, and it was an art, then I went up to the outlet center and all that. They don't like that. They, they want a give and take. And so you need to explain to your client, I'm going to give you every opportunity to tell your story. You're the storyteller. Now, on cross-examination, it's the reverse. And I will say something when I've told people this. They say, how do you do it? And I say, you just do it. The witness is irrelevant. I'll say it again. The witness is irrelevant when you're cross-examining. You are the storyteller when you're cross-examining. You are the storyteller. You give answers. And you ought to be prepared when you do it. You know what story you want to tell. When a witness gets on the stand, you know what 
story you want to tell. Or you should. Basically, who is he? What does he know? How does he know it? And you're going to want to bring out parts of the story that they didn't bring out. And you're going to want to try to bring it out in a story form. I don't care if you're talking about science. Make it a story. But you're the storyteller, which means that you make statements that they have to agree with. Now, let me talk first about a visual aid that you can all use, you can all do, doesn't cost that much, and can be very, very effective. And that is a storyboard. I use storyboards in every case. Now, a lot of lawyers now that have the PowerPoints and the computers, they like to do it all on the computer. And I've talked to a lot of jury consultants who tell me that they feel that there's a lot of lawyers, particularly in those that are doing well and have the money to spend on technology that are really overdoing it and, and, and losing the jury, particularly if you have an older jury. What you do has got to be pretty framework. If you've got a real young jury, you use more technology. If you have an older jury, you don't use much technology. It's just a general rule. But the problem with using computer projections for everything is it disconnects you from the jury. Oftentimes, better than the computer PowerPoint is just a board. Now, the one board that you can use in every case you have that is, in my experience, really essential is to put together what I call a storyboard. It helps you tell the story. Now, here's a case. I think it is in one of the uh, closing arguments or opening statements in the back of the book involving the lady who had the unnecessary mastectomy. But this is the storyboard we used during opening statement. And then we came back and referred to it again in closing argument. But it's got the picture of the plaintiff, which you can have, the picture of the doctor who was not a defendant but involved, the picture of the doctor who was involved because he had done the surgery who was a defendant, the picture of the pathologist, the picture of the hospital, and it goes through what happened a picture of, the micro, of a microscope, and it just goes through the story all on one board. Now, the story is pretty complicated here, so we had to cut out a lot of things to get it all on one board. But the interesting thing is, if you have a storyboard, it also allows you not to use so many notes because you know you're going to be referring to things up here, and it also lets the jury follow it. And if I'm standing here, and I'm talking about Lois and how she felt this lump on her breast. I can stand next to her. You can see Lois, and, you, and I can still make eye contact with you. Now, in this particular case, I didn't begin with a storyboard because when I give an opening statement, mm -hmm. I always want to stand right behind my client when I begin my opening statement. And I began that opening statement with, Lois, you have cancer. We need to operate right away. That's the way I began the opening statement. And the reason was, was because that's what, after they had done this bob, see, they came in her room and told her when they hadn't even gotten the frozen section, the permanent sections looked at, which later when they looked at them, she didn't have cancer. They were going on the frozen section, which had not been properly uh, treated or examined. And so you have that concept of a storyboard that you can use that goes through the different and then when you get down to you've got here you say where people can see it for reconstructive surgeries neuroma treatment for scarring treatment for deformities and you have it and so you're connecting both verbally and visually so a storyboard is something you can put together for opening statement you can use it later in examining witnesses even and you can use it for closing argument but basically, it's just like if you ever did, as I did when I was a boy, vacation Bible school. It's about what they did in vacation Bible school, and they told us the Bible stories. So 
it's a, it's a way of learning. And see, the thing that, that makes stories so powerful in court is that's the way we all learn as children. We all learn through stories. And that's why it's so powerful even in the courtroom. Another thing that you can illustrate that, that's good to have by way of a visual aid is what you call comparison, what I call right way, wrong way. It's always good to have right way, wrong way. And you can use right way, wrong way in so many ways. I just have one here in a case that we've handled that is a shoulder dystocia case. Some of you know that if you have a big macrosomic baby, sometimes the doctors, when they're trying to deliver that extra large child, usually because the mother had diabetes, microsomic, meaning extra large, and the shoulders are particularly large, and you shouldn't try to deliver it, if possible, vaginally. But doctors do, and if you have a shoulder dystocia where the shoulder catches up in the birth canal, there's a way to deliver that baby, and then there's a way not to deliver that baby, because if you do, you put pressure on the cervical cord, and you can injure the baby, and you see these people that have these wildered arms, Herb's palsy, that's usually from a dystocia, uh, a bad delivery, for reason their arms are like that. But this is just a way to show right way, wrong way. Now, there's all kinds of right way, wrong way. I tried a case years ago that involved a warning that the manufacturer had put on an incubator. The warning was insufficient to warn the nurses of over-oxygenating premature babies because if you give premature too much oxygen, you make him go blind. Our baby was blind. We had an expert in the engineering department at a and who came in and said, this is the way the warning should have been worded, and this is the way they had it worded on their incubator, and we put it up in the courtroom, right way, wrong way, what they did, what they should have done. So there's all kinds of illustrations that you can work into your story for right way, wrong way. And there's all kinds of really magical things you can do with a story because you can step out of your story of what happened and talk about what should have happened and the way things should be if it hadn't been for what the defendant did. So right way, wrong way is another way to um, illustrate things. And then next we have, I think some we're going to just put up real quick uh, to show. Here is a uh, timeline. This was a case where a woman came in in breach and uh, there was a delay in delivering the child and he ended up brain damaged. And all we wanted to show was the delay. I mean, a lot of other things were happening, but you want to keep it simple. You don't want a timeline to get too involved. And if, what's the next one, Dave? And then here is a, another kind of timeline, but in this case, this fellow had a ruptured aneurysm. And he had been seen in one hospital. They transferred him to another. And the nurses were supposed to tell the doctor if his vital signs uh, started uh, sinking and he started crashing. And what we wanted to illustrate here was that he started crashing when he got to the hospital and nobody called the doctor, which they didn't. So the guy ended up dying. So we wanted a simple timeline and keep it as simple as we could to show the earlier admission, he gets to the hospital, he starts crashing immediately and nobody calls. Simple timeline. Then we go to, this is a case that we tried uh, the argument is in the book. It's one way we did it. What happened in this case was that it was an anesthesia mishap. And if any of y'all ever handle these cases, when they give anesthesia to somebody, they have an anesthesiologist there ministering the anesthesia, and they have a chart, and they're writing down the vital signs as the procedure progresses. And in this case, we got the chart, and if you believe the chart, this man went in, slid into an arrest, and uh, they pretty well got on it. But we requested, we had a hard time getting it, the new anesthesia machines have what is called a memory capability. 
you can push a button and it runs a strip out. Now the machine is recording all the vital signs. The anesthesiologist is just looking at the numbers and writing them down. So we had asked for it, they had it, they didn't want us to have it, and we had some hearings, finally the judge gave it to us. And the whole thing was, there was a, there, we knew the difference between the time in the machine and the time on the OR clock they were using, it wasn't identical. The question was how much was it off? Was it off two minutes? Was it off 20 minutes? Because if the machine and the clock in the OR were 20 minute difference, then this poor guy laid there for a long time without a heartbeat and nobody did a thing about it. And I got one of their experts to admit if they let him lay there for a minute, that was negligent. So what we did, because trying to show that concept and the difference in lining up the anesthesia record and lining up the uh, memory strip, we did something new. We had a real big board for court. And the interesting thing about this, we had lots of fights. And when we interviewed the jury, we got a very good, very fair verdict. And uh, we interviewed the jury afterwards. They came out and said, within 20 minutes, we had decided on the liability questions because we had your slide rule. And what this was is an exhibit where you could take the anesthesia record and the memory strip and then the CPR record that they started after uh, they came in to try and resuscitate him. And you could move these around. And we had a, a, an interesting, very strange blood pressure that showed up both on the memory strip and the anesthesia record. And so when you lined those up, you could get the correlation that in fact it was a 20 minute difference between the clock and the anesthesia machine. Now the reason that this kind of thing works, if you ever have a case, if you can find something in your case to make into an exhibit that the jury can play with, it's dangerous, but if you're comfortable with it, anything a jury can play with will be more persuasive than anything else. Think about it. They get to go back and solve it for themselves. Now, there's another thing that happens, and it uh, comes out of this same case while I'm on it. Oftentimes, we're looking for ways to illustrate something that we know is right, but the other side will have somebody come in and swear that it's wrong. And how do you deal with that? Well, in this, in this particular case, the CRNA had testified, and they had experts that testified because our position was this guy didn't just fall off a cliff all at once and his heart stopped beating all at once. He had a period of uh, bradycardia where his heart rate had slowed down to dangerous levels, and they just kept him going without doing anything about it. But the CRNA had said that unless the heart rate got below 45, she did not consider the patient to be bradycardic. So during the trial, and then we had it to work in the story at closing argument, which you can see the example, we got a pretty high tech, everything we do doesn't have to be high tech, we went and got a metronome, common metronome, get it in a music store. And what we did with our expert is we had him set it at what the fellow's baseline was. Baseline heart rate, baseline pulse. So that the jury could hear what it sounds like. That's probably what if somebody put a, a blood pressure monitor on you or a stethoscope on your chest listening to your heart, that, that's similar to what they would hear now because you're all probably around 89, 90, something like that. You're sitting, resting. That was his baseline. But his blood pressure had gone to 45 and been at 45 for like 15 or 20 minutes, and they hadn't done anything about it. And they said, well, they didn't consider that alarming. So what we did with our metronome, we just put it up so people could hear what 45 sounded like.
And we were able then, in closing argument, to say, you know, work it into the story that, you know, they were saying, we don't have to worry about that. So there's just lots of things you can do to make your stories come alive. And that's what you want to do, is make your stories come alive. Now, all of you have tried cases where you have used a damage chart at the end. You put the figures up and you say, these are our damages. Special damages, general damages. When we try our cases and we put on a life care planner who's saying we have a brain damaged child, they're going to need this appliance, they're going to need that appliance. We have in our office a whole scheme of things that we've used in other cases. So every time the health life care planner says they need a van, we put a, we've got pictures of vans to put up. Uh, when they say they need this kind of uh, device, uh, exercise device, rehabilitation device, we've got pictures of it to put up. People don't like to buy something that they haven't seen. That's just a simple rule of persuasion. And if you're asking people, well, this lady and this, this poor baby needs all this, trust us, it's out there, we can get it, that's a hard sell. But if you've got somebody on the stand testifying and saying, they're going to need this, a picture goes up. They're going to need this, a picture goes up. This picture goes up. Now, when you get to the end of your case, There are people, this is kind of an exception to keeping your exhibit simple. When you get it in, you could just put up your damage chart with the numbers on there, but the problem is a damage chart at the end that you're going to argue from that's just figures, where does that get you? I, I don't know, it doesn't get me anywhere. But you've got to do it, you want them to have the figures, but why not, at the risk of making it more complicated than you'd ordinarily like, Put up pictures of what you're talking about. So when you're talking about special damages, people are reminded now, oh, yeah, this, this, go, this is going to pay for the van. This is going to pay for the wheelchair. This is going to pay for this device. Put up pictures. Then you get down to your general damages. What have you got? Well, you remind them. The general damages have to do with things like worry. And you put it, see, black on white. Uh, and and the, the things that you can bring out that people have to deal with when they have a child that's going to be brain damaged for life, to remind them of that's what you're talking about. So it's one of the few exceptions that I think where you might make something more, put more in than you might ordinarily need. People, you, if you've attended very many programs, you have heard uh, people say uh, every trial needs a theme, and it ought to be one theme. And this is something that's discussed in the book. I disagree with that. I think you need two themes. The cognitive theme is what we talked about earlier. It's what holds the science and the facts together. It's the idea that makes people think, yeah, it did cause it, or they were negligent, or whatever. One drink too many. Well, that says that alcohol caused the wreck. That's the cognitive theme. And you have your cognitive theme, and it is the theme you start with in opening statement, and you go through the whole trial with the cognitive theme. The defendant, you give an opening statement. The defendant uh, gives an opening statement. You call witnesses. They call witnesses. You get down to the end. They give their closing. Uh, we, you give your closing summation. They give their closing summation. Then as plaintiff, you have the right to close. And the way I view it from the story standpoint is it's like the moral of a movie. I, I have never seen a movie that I did not get the moral until the movie ended. You always get it right at the end. It's the lesson of the story. It's what inspires us. It's what makes us want to act. And as soon as you sit down, that's what's going to happen. Your audience is going to act. Some people call it empowering the jury. Some people call it inspiring the jury. What I call it is an effective theme. It is the second theme. Cognitive theme gives them the reason. It appeals to the head. 
the cognitive theme introduced in rebuttal is what appeals to the heart. So what we're going to talk about here in conclusion are the things that you can consider for a cognitive theme. These are core values that people have that you can use as your cognitive theme or empowering theme. People should take responsibility for their actions. We've heard political campaigns use that. People ought to be responsible for their actions. In fact, it's been pretty well distorted as to what that means in some camps. But still, the idea is, in your case, your client was injured by someone else, and they won't take responsibility for what they did. And they ought to take responsibility. What I said earlier, we don't want to be here, but we had to come in order for them to be held responsible because they would not step up to the plate and do the right thing. Rules are good and should be followed. Some of you have been following the Enron trial. And the prosecutor put up, as part of the prosecution's opening close, they had a big sign, a statement from Ken Lay that said, we should not be a slave to rules. Because the prosecution's big point was the people at Enron didn't follow the rules. So people want people to follow the rules, and it ties in when you use the rules of the road earlier in your case. People think you ought to follow the rules, particularly when they make their rules. Hard work and perseverance will eventually triumph. Honesty will eventually be rewarded. Good people will come to the aid of those wrongfully injured and deserving. Simple and uneducated working men and women possess a special ability to recognize truth and cannot be easily deceived. Those are all uh, rules, core values, things that you can appeal to. All right. I want to close by telling a story. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome again, and uh, hope everybody had a good lunch. My name is Michael Black. I'm proud to be a lawyer in San Antonio, and I think that we all have the calling. I think being a lawyer, as, as Jim, I think, would concur, and as we've discussed, is the highest secular calling that anybody can have. And what Jim has done this morning, and, and then again in this question and answer session with all of us, is to really show us uh, how to unlock the code to being the best lawyers possible, the best advocates possible uh, for our clients with the storytelling. Let's find out a little bit, uh, Jim Perdue, about your background, uh, not only as a lawyer, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, but also as, as a person. Tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up and, and what were your influences in being a good storyteller and in being a great lawyer? Well, that's an open-ended question, isn't it? I'm not sure I have the answers to some of that. But I was born in Dallas, Texas, and, uh, and grew up for the most part in Dallas. But then uh, we moved around a lot. As I tell people, my father was into creative finance before it became popular, <clears throat> which meant he spent some vacation time up in Huntsville. So um, we, were, we grew up very poor, and uh, my mother was a legal secretary, and she was the uh, most saintly woman I think I've ever known, and um, the biggest influence in my life was uh, my mother and my grandmother, because when I was a young boy, my mother worked. I never knew a time when my mother didn't work, and uh, my grandmother raised me, and um, so they were probably the most influential people until I got into high school. And then when I got into high school, of course our father was not around. I had one brother. And I started hanging around with a fellow who just died here this year. I gave the eulogy at his funeral about three, four months ago. His name was Baxter Brown. And his uh, father was Elro Brown. I think I've mentioned him in the book in a brief note. But Elro was an official with the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union. In fact, I was telling a bit of this story last night at dinner. 
Um, Elro had grown up in the labor movement. And he could tell you stories about uh, when people were striking for better wages and striking for better working conditions of how the corporations or all companies would send the goons out to beat them up and get the police to go beat them up to break up the strikes. And uh, so I became very, uh, very pro-labor and pro-Democrat at an early age. His wife's daddy uh, had a card file that at least this big, and she knew every Democratic voter in Harris County, I think, and she could look them up and get people help. You know, they needed help with this, that, or the other. And they were very active in Democratic politics, and I, I think they were probably the biggest influence in my life And going over and playing bridge and chess all night long until the next morning and listening to them. So they were a big influence. Um, and there's a fellow by the name of Bill Kilgarland who was on our Supreme Court for a while that was my debate coach in college, and Bill was a big Democrat, so he was a big influence. And, uh, and I think those were probably the people that uh, most uh, influenced my, uh, my life. Have you always found it natural to be a storyteller and, and to share stories with everybody? Is that something that came not only from your personal experiences growing up with family, and friends and mentors, but also from listening to radio programs, as you describe in the book. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's interesting when you grow up in the days of radio, as I did, uh, younger people never did have that experience. We didn't have television. We were poor. We didn't get a TV until everybody in the neighborhood had one, then we got to use one. But uh, we got our entertainment as a boy. I, I don't think, I, I was probably, uh, gosh, uh, almost in bed middle school by the time we got a television, but they had these radio shows. And uh, the neat thing about radio is that it makes you make your own pictures. Uh, you listen to radio and you make your own pictures and you learn that you can, with your words and description and the way you tell things, cause people to make their own pictures. I mean, today, if you were to try to suggest that to somebody, they'd probably turn you off. I mean, if you, you don't have any pictures, they don't want to listen. But I think it does give a trial lawyer an advantage to have grown up in those days where uh, people did and could make their own pictures. Must have been a great theater of the mind for you back then. It days. was a great theater of the mind. Everybody had a different idea of what the shadow looked like. What was your uh, major at the University of Houston and what made you inspired or, or to go to law school? Well, I... Um, I grew up very poor, and when I graduated from high school, I didn't think there was a chance in the world I'd ever go to college. I had a couple of breaks. Uh, one is um, Elro, knew a neighbor who uh, worked at a smelter on Market Street and said they were looking for somebody to help out part-time. And so I got me a job at a, the smelter, and I hitchhiked for from our house to the smelter, which was about five, six miles, for about three weeks or a month during the summer until I saved up enough money to put down on a car that I bought, a 1953 Lincoln convertible, which was uh, I wanted a Ford, but the salesman talked me into the Lincoln. Little did I know that you, you, know, you couldn't keep tires under it and everything that was electric quit on you after you drove it off the lot. But. Anyway, I, I had a car so I could get back and forth to school. I still didn't have the money to get in college because I was just able to get to that point. And I got a call from Bill Kilgarland, who had been, who had met in Democratic politics. And I swear, I don't know where this money came from, and Bill has never told me, but he called me up, and of course he knew my situation, and he said, uh, where are you going to college? And I said, Bill, I don't think I'm going to college because I... I don't have any, anywhere you went, you had to have money. I had gone with uh, some friends of mine up to Texas and I, we'd, we'd looked at some of the seediest dorms you can imagine up here and hell, what they were wanted for rent was, a, you know, I would have had to rob a Brinks truck or something to even think about paying for that. I mean, it was just out of my mind what it would cost to, to go to college. So I had kind of decided I'll just have to work at the smelter and for a year and maybe save up enough money where I can 
put some tuition down. Well, Bill called me and said, uh, where are you going to college? I said, Bill, I'm not going. And he said, uh, well, I have a debate scholarship for you. If you'll come to the University of Houston and debate, and of course, I, the idea of debating was great. U of H, you know, was there in town. And uh, so I said, well, sure, Bill. I mean, I'm going to U of H. So, uh, uh, and from that time on, I have, in every way I can, been the biggest supporter of the University of Houston. I mean, uh, Noni and I go to the, all the football and basketball games. We fly with the team to games. I contribute to them, try to contribute what I can. And um, But it's my school. And so once I got in U of H, I'd go at night, work at the smelter day, work at the smelter day, go at night, and, you know, just whatever. And uh, from the time I started in September of 57 until I graduated from law school in January of 60, uh, Three, I never missed a semester. Summer, fall, never. I never had a holiday. It was just work and school, work and school, because I was poor and my big fear was I wasn't going to get out. So they had a program in those days you could enter law school in your senior year and it would count as your senior year on your baccalaureate and in first year in law school. So you, you can do the math. I, I got out pretty quick, which was pretty good, but I, I, uh, I just wanted to be a lawyer, and I wanted to get out so I could do it, and um, that's the way that happened. Did the help and encouragement and support that you received from family and from Justice Kilgarland and from uh, others who influenced you uh, help also uh, inspire you to uh, be a person and a lawyer who, who helps others and who gives back? There have been so many people in my life that have helped me that uh, that's why I, I, I try to help others. Uh, there have been, I, I, I have so many people that I owe so much to. I was telling Mike and them the story last night. I, I had, uh, y'all aren't old enough to remember, but we had a big recession in 1960, and um, I lost my job at the smelter, and I was working as a debate coach at the University of Houston, but it didn't pay anything, and I didn't have enough money to finish. I had the summer semester and the fall, and I'd graduate. I was missing, really only needed a few hours. I could have graduated then the summer, but I couldn't quite get there. And so, uh, but I didn't have a job. Didn't have any way to put gas in my car, and uh, my mom never was able to help. And I was pretty desperate, and so um, I went down to see a fellow by the name of Woodrow Seals, who had been Harris County Democratic chairman during the uh, Kennedy campaign. And when Kennedy won, he was appointed U.S. attorney for uh, that district. And so I know Woodrow through Democratic politics, and I went down and told him my plight. And he picked up the phone, and he called a fellow by the name of Jack Proctor, who was the managing partner at Fulbright and Jaworski. And he said, Jack, I uh, said, uh, y'all ever hire any of these uh, law students that are in their senior year for summer clerks? And uh, Jack said, no, we don't, and nor does any other firm in this, the city I know about. Well, you don't hire law students. You don't hire them as clerks. And uh, Woodrow says, don't you think it'd be a good idea if y'all tried that? Get you a chance to, you know, see what a young man looks like before he gets out. And Of course, we had had one graduate from U of H, uh, a fellow by the name of Royce Till, who worked at Fulbright. Because U of H in those days, we were in the basement. We were not considered a acceptable law school. You know, they, they big firms all hired from Texas, Yale, and Harvard, and SMU. And so uh, I went over and saw Jack Proctor. Uh, Woodrow got me in, and Jack said, well, we're going to hire you during the summer. So I worked during the summer, and when the summer was over, Royce Till, who I had done some work with, said, we want to offer you a job. And I said, well, Royce, I, I appreciate it, but I don't think I can take it because I have my service I have to do. And he said, well, you're old enough, you're not going to be drafted. And I said, yeah, but, you know, I have had my deferments, and there have been, this was when Vietnam was just starting up, and I said, there's poor people that, that are going off service. They, they don't have deferments, and they had to go, and I don't think it would be fair that I didn't have to do some service just because I could get deferred long enough to get through college and law school and I feel like I need to do my service. And I was looking at a 
JAG stand of five years, and uh, and Roy said, well, you know, you could, they've got these reserve programs, and I said, well, I, I'll think about it. And anyway, I went back, and summer was over, and I was back in school full-time last semester, and I was in the library, and somebody came down, and they said, uh, Dean Blakely, who, if any of y'all have any connection to the University of Houston Law School, know he's a legend uh, there. I mean, and, Dean Blakely was somebody you couldn't, it'd be like telling the President of the United States you weren't going to do something he wanted you to do. Anyway, I went into Dean Blakely's office and he says, I've heard a very bad, bad rumor on you. And I said, well, what is it, and Dean? What, what have I done? And he said, well, we understand you have an offer from Fulbright and Jorsky and you're not going to take it. And I said, well, no, I, I've got my service to do. And he said, uh, Dean said, "You got to figure out a way to do it." He said, "We, we, you, you're the, you're the top of your class. We can't get anybody at the big firms to hire anybody from our law school. Don't you feel like you owe it to the law school?" And of course, Dean Blakely asked you to do something. He did it, and I said, "Well, I'll figure it out." So I made some calls and found a way to do six months active duty, and then talked to Fulbright, and they said, "We don't care. Come in. You know, you graduate in January. Go off and do your take the bar in April. Come off." Come and do your six months and come here in September. And so that's what we did. And I went to work in September. And I don't know how many of y'all ever did service or active duty. Um, I wasn't very long after I got back. I got my commission in the JAG Reserve. So really my only time as an enlisted man was my six months out in the you know boot camp in the Pacific. Uh, but when you do your active duty as an enlisted man, you you've got petty officers that don't haven't gotten through the ninth grade telling you what to do, and you better damn well do it. And uh, so when I went to work for Fulbright and Jaworski, unlike the guys that graduated from Texas and SMU and Yale and Harvard who came in and thought they were the cat's meow, when I stepped through the door. My attitude was, these secretaries are just like my damn drill sergeants. They know what's going on, and if they tell me to do something, I'm going to do it. And uh, so it wasn't long. I, they were telling me I was all the secretary's favorite lawyer, and they'd do anything for me, and it was because I treated them right. You know, I treated them decent. I didn't look down on them. I, hell, I knew they knew more than I did. <laughs> and, you know, I'd be going out, now what, now what should we do here, or can we do this, or, or what, and they'd be telling me. And, and other people, I'd be telling them, no, we're going to do it that way. And the secretary would say, you can't do it that way. By God, I graduated from Harvard. I know how we do it. And uh, so I, it was a different experience. So I had a lot of things in my life that affected, I think, me than my, the way I look at things and do things. Well, I always enjoy uh, talking with you. We've done this before and uh, look forward to the next time. But uh, uh, one of the favorite parts that I have in doing this together with you is, is bringing all of you guys up to the microphone and asking your questions or <laughs> sharing your stories along with Jim Perdue. So if anybody has any questions from the presentation from this morning uh, or from our exchange right now, please feel free to step up to one of the microphones that are set up on a, either side of the table and share it with us. Yes, sir. First of all, I'd like to say I truly enjoyed today's presentation. I have a unique practice in the sense that most of my caseload involved breach of contract cases. Uh, primarily from a plaintiff's viewpoint, but they're tried almost exclusively in front of an arbitrator or in the bench trial format. Could you please uh, provide me with perhaps any additional wisdom or uh, the asterisk to the, the wisdom that you provided us today on how you would take what you've learned and distill that into a recommendation that you would give me uh, in my practice for breach of contract in the bench trial or arbitrator format. Thank you. Well, I don't know that I have a simple answer uh, to, to that other than my experience. And I've, I don't do a lot, a lot of arbitration. Uh, I've tried some you know, bench trials in my career, but I don't know that the principles are any, any different. Um, most people, uh, even if they're trained legally, um, such as an arbiter or a judge, I think most people still have a 
part of them that you want to appeal to other than just the, the head and the logic and everything. In fact, uh, you know, there's a story, I don't remember if we got it and made it, made it to the book or not, but there is a story of a man after World War I that was a judge, and he went off and served in World War I, and uh, it took a bullet wound to his head, and he survived. But it knocked out, not the logic part, it knocked out the part of his brain that we would call uh, emotion, or values, or you know, the, the, just the, the sense of what is right and wrong. I mean, he was still was very logical, but he resigned. I mean, it's a true story. He, he resigned as a judge because he said, I cannot be a judge anymore because I do not have the ability to understand compassion and mercy and love and charity. I, I don't have that ability anymore. And he resigned. So I, I kind of put aside the idea that, you know, all judges are heartless or all arbiters are heartless. I, I, I think it's really no difference. You need the same elements of your story. And um, I don't know, if I were presenting something to an arbiter, I'm not sure I would change up much of what I would do before a jury, but that may just be me. But I think even, you know, the neat thing in my practice that I'm finding, and it gets more and more this way, and uh, judges, when I come into their court, courtroom and say, we're going to trial, and I hadn't been to trial in a while, we've got some coming up, but judges, when they find a good lawyer coming into the courtroom with a, a significant case, they really want you there. Because they don't get to see very many interesting. Most of the stuff they do, they'll tell you, is real dull and dully done. You know, they, there's a saying that um, uh, drama is life with the dull parts taken out. Well, there's some lawyers that believe that a trial is drama with the dull parts put back in. And so I really do think that uh, the principles of storytelling and all the things that go with it, an interesting story, well-told story, using some of the rhetorical techniques that are in the book would work just as well with an arbiter or judge as they would with a jury, be my thinking. Um, and a lot of the things, I think, for example, the, um, the rules of the road thing that we talked about this morning, I think that would work very well. Um, that is a very good technique, and then you build your story you know, from that. I mean, the judge has got to understand in a contract case, if you go in and you're the plaintiff and the rule of the road is, you know, you, that this means this, or that, and why, why does it mean that, the reason for the rule, how the defendant, I think that'd be a great schematic to use in a presentation in a contract case. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, first, I do want to thank you for the presentation today. I'm a, I'm a trial lawyer. Been been so for a while. Uh, I do much more criminal than civil, though I do civil as well. And I, I think you've done a lot towards uh, refreshing my memory on a lot of things that I'd, that I'd gone away and also enhancing in some things. One thing you touched on and that I've heard of but I've never really gone into is the concept of psychodrama. Uh, you mentioned it without going into it. I, I, I would appreciate if you could spend a few minutes discussing that. Be glad to. Uh, there's some discussion in the book about it, so you'll find it in the book of, of psychodrama. Psychodrama is, is, a, is, a, is a complex thing because even the uh, therapists, psychologists use psychodrama as a, as a form of therapy. And there's all kind. They they do it all kinds of ways. They they might, for example, they might say if if they're using it with a uh, a parent having trouble with a child, they might ask the parent to play the role of the child to try and get insight in why the child's doing what he is or what the reaction is. Or 
they might, when they're working with a husband and wife, get the husband to take the role of the wife, and so that, that's the way therapists use it. But in the courtroom, my concept, and I'm certainly not the one to say that this is the way it is, but my concept of psychodrama is, number one, it is when you have the ability first to take your audience to the time and place that it happened. That's the first thing. Now, interestingly enough, when you're telling, this is something I didn't, some things, I'm just gonna kind of ramble here for a bit, so, uh, because of what you asked. Interestingly enough, most lawyers, when they are giving an opening statement, and there's always at least one critical, sometimes two critical scenes in your story where the critical events happen. Interestingly, few trial lawyers spend the time to set the scene. In other words, they start talking about the, the wreck or the product blew up or something. They, they don't take any time to tell you what it was like, where it was, what it felt like. And setting the scene is, is more setting how it felt. How did the place feel? Not necessarily that, you know, this room has light wood paneling and, and it's got some wainscoting on it, but, you know, it's a big room and it's uh, got a lot of people in it that, that are trying to get better and learn. And so it's creating the mood. And then one of the ways that you do that, which is kind of fascinating, is although we're mainly visual learners, interestingly, the sense of smell is the one that most connects with the subconscious. The fascinating thing about the sense of smell is you can't describe it. If you haven't experienced it, don't try to describe the way something smells. You can't do it. I mean, try it sometime. To describe to somebody uh, the way a lemon smells and they've never seen a lemon. You can't do it. But it connects with the subconscious, so when I'm setting a scene, if, if it happened in a hospital room or delivery room, I wanna talk just a little bit about, you can smell the disinfectant. You can smell the betadine. You can smell the alcohol. You know, and, and, you, and, it's, and it's cool back here in the operating room because they keep it cooler than other places. There's a lot of reasons for that, but it's cool. And you can hear the tinkling of the, of the metal instruments and things like that. I want to set the scene before I start talking about what happened. And one way you do that is with the sense of smell. Now, the fascinating thing about psychodrama is that if you can get your audience and I normally don't do this in opening statement, I do it in closing argument. In opening statement, because all I'm talking about is what happened, what the facts are gonna be. So I'm creating my story. But I'm gonna do the same thing in closing argument. I wanna take them where it is. And you will see examples in the book. The amazing thing about psychodrama, if you can do it, is that you can set up a mystical ability in your listeners to be they can to be protectors. For example, there, there's some cases in the in the book of if you use psychodrama. There's a, a case in the book involving the pitocin. There's another case where we use psychodrama. I, I've got I always use it now. You can, in fact, I just recently did the closing argument in uh, the Potosin case in Washington, D.C. twice. Uh, did it one day and then did another group the second day. If you use psychodrama, you, you can get the audience to go back to that point. And the way you do it is telling it in the present tense like we talked about. It didn't happen. It hasn't happened. It's happening now and we're standing there. And you tell your audience using rhetorical techniques like embedded commands. You know, stand with me now in the operating room, or stand with me now in the delivery room while Nurse uh, 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 Terman is uh, caring for this mother, and she decides, 
well, I'm just going to give this mother Pitocin, speed this labor along. She doesn't need it. The doctor hadn't given an order, but she just decided I'm going to give her some Pitocin. Now stand with me in the, in, the, in the delivery room as Nurse Terman goes to the supply cabinet and she opens it up and she pulls out a vial of Pitocin. Don't we want to yell at her? No, don't do that. That can overstimulate the uterus. You give this mother Pitocin when her labor is progressing normally, you give her Pitocin and you can rupture the uterus. Blow the uterus out. Brain damage the baby. Don't do it. And then you can talk about, and then she brings the Pitocin over and we see her setting it up for the piggyback drip. Don't we want to yell at her? Don't do it. Don't give this mother Pitocin. You don't have a doctor's order to do that. And then when you do it that way, you see, you can really get the jury involved. And then if you want to get really ma ma magical, after you do that, and the jury's already heard all the evidence. And this is what we do, in, and you'll see the example in the book, what you can do is you get to a point you can say, all right, let's go back to the labor room, and the nurse does the right thing. She does the right thing by deciding, choosing to do nothing, because this mother is progressing normally, well. The obstetrician's going to be there in 20 minutes. This baby's going to be delivered. It's going to be healthy. It's going to be normal. She does the right thing. She hears us. She started to give the Pitocin. And we said, don't give it, Nurse Terman. Don't give it. And she hears us. And so she doesn't give the Pitocin. Now, I'm dealing with a brain-damaged baby. So now I can take, and I've, I've got a chart that I use, which is a milestone chart. And I say, now, the baby's delivered. At six months, he's crawling. At a year, he's walking. I've got this whole chart, and I go through a normal life. You know, when he's walking, when he's talking, when he's doing this, when he's doing that. And when I did it, fascinating thing, both times I did it, the people were crying. The imag picturing the way the child could have been as opposed to what we had already shown on video today, which was a tragic picture of a brain-damaged child. And you start talking about the way it could have been. So... Th Psychodrama in the courtroom can be really magical. Does that help you any? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any other questions or stories or comments? Uh, question. Yes, sir. <laughs> Jim, it's fallen a lot of some of us to present those excuses on behalf of the defendants. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what uh, advice or tips or recommendations would you have for those of us that do that in opposing guys like you? Uh, I spoke in, uh, some years back. I was invited down to Alcapuco to uh, go speak to the uh, defense lawyer group. I know y'all have a couple, uh, the national group. DRI? Uh, well, I might have been to DRI. I don't remember. It's a big group. I was by myself. I didn't have a lady in my life at the time and went down by myself. And went there. I thought there might be something to do. There's nothing to do if you're by yourself. <laughs> Walk the beach. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, uh, they asked me to come down and speak in that same regard. And I, and I told them that I think the biggest thing that I would tell defense lawyers is that if you're going to defend a case, you have to have a competing story. And to, to think I'm going to defend it on the basis of, well, that didn't prove, that didn't prove, that didn't prove. I got an explanation for that, which is the way a lot of defense lawyers do. I don't, I think you run, run risk of not being very effective. I think you have to get up and have a competing story. Something that is saying, this is the story we want, and then and then press on your story. Uh, my experience with defendants is that they want to ride too many horses in the same race. And, uh, you know, a trial's not a relay horse race. It's really just a horse race. I mean, your horse is going to win or lose. And uh, the fact you can get on more horses than one isn't going to make you win. And that's what I find is that defendants just can't figure out what one they want to ride I think a defendant does better picking out their best defense 
and just hammering it in. Maybe you got some others that you think, well, I could throw it in. But I think when, the more you throw in, the more it waters down uh, what you're doing. That's just my thought. Thank you, sir. We have another question. But I do a different type of litigation, and I was surprised only by one thing. I, my mentor in litigation said, and it ties into your saying that the most powerful, the beginning, the first three minutes, and you tied it to your opening statement. And you said, don't waste your story before voir dire. I was told and trained, you stand up there, you can give a brief summary of the facts, and you tell the damn story until somebody objects and you, because of the notion of primacy. And that, that three, and so we used to do, my mentor and I did a three minute drill. We'd come up with the theme of the case, I'd be going, it was during custody litigation, I'm a divorce lawyer. And I would come up with something uh, that I know that somebody's gonna object in about three minutes if I'm standing up there making a final argument is the first thing I say to them. And I didn't, you know, but I walked up and started talking about the facts of the case immediately. And I was just wondering what is the, what is the reason for not doing that, Mr. Perdue? How, how, uh, how old is your mentor? Uh, seven or eight years older than I, and I'm 60. When, when, about what time would your mentor have started practicing? When did he start practice? I think he went to law school later than I did. So he started probably in 1970. I got out in 68. Well, let me remind those of you who don't go back as far as I go. I'll tell you how all this came about and tell you, um, I think I can explain. When I got out of law school in 1963, our rules of procedure did not provide for the giving of an opening statement. It said, it had, at the beginning of the trial, the plaintiff will read their pleadings. The defendant will read their pleadings. You will then, the plaintiff will offer evidence, the defendant will offer evidence. So we had no opening statement. So lawyers of my generation and the generation that preceded me, since we didn't give an opening statement, and who listens to the reading of pleadings? I mean, you get up to the jury and you've got all this in there, and uh, we, we try to draft our petition and read like novels, but I mean, it's still, I mean, you're reading a pleading, and our judges, at least in Harris County, strictly enforced it. If you, we had one judge, uh, John Snell, if you said now, you know, we're saying, and plaintiff says that the defendant is negligent, and you'd say that means that he failed to exercise ordinary care. Snell would say, stick to the pleadings. You can't paraphrase. I mean, he, you, you had to read them. That was all. Well, since we couldn't give an opening statement, all the lawyers decided, well, we'll just use the voir dire examination to give the opening statement. And so even though that rule changed in the 70s, and I forget exactly when in the 70s, where you could give an opening statement, you still had this generation of lawyers that had grown up thinking the only place to give an opening statement is the voir dire examination. Now, there is a recent Supreme Court case, and I very seldom talk on anything substantive anymore. I've got a son that does that. Um, but there's a recent Supreme Court case because for, I have written a number of articles over the years where I have been suggesting do not talk a lot about your facts during the voir dire examination. And the Supreme Court cited me in a case that they reversed on, on for some uh, uh, failures to grant challenges for cause, and I don't want to get into all of that. But the problem with doing what you suggest is that if you're going to go for disqualification for cause, and you get up and start talking about the facts of the case, you run the risk of having somebody say, well, you know, if you prove that, I'd have to go with you. And so you're losing your good jurors. And my feeling is, and I'll give you an example here in a minute how to do it, but not do it. So my feeling is that you, you want to get up and you want to say, this is a case about 
Sally Jones, who went to see her doctor because she was having trouble with her hip. The doctor implanted a prosthesis. A month after it was implanted, the prosthesis broke. The prosthesis was defective. It wasn't made to specifications, and she has sued the manufacturer. That's it. She's had a lot of complications. That's enough. And then you, then you ask questions. But the problem is, if you do what you're suggesting, you run the risk of losing a lot of people, and people, as they have gotten more sophisticated, my experience is they start holding it against you. They're saying, you're trying, to, you're trying to convince us, you're trying to sell us on your side of the case before we even get picked on the jury. And so I don't do that. Now, what I do do, if I have a, a, an issue, for example, let's say I had, let's say I, you, you're, you're trying a case, and you've got a, a case, and you can show in a product case that the manufacturer violated the industrial standards or the standards of that manufacturing group. Good case. I mean, show, by God, they violate. You're tempted to want to get up and say on board our examination, and our case, we will have evidence that they violated their own standards. Well, why do you want to do that? Isn't it better to say, instead of saying it, to get up and say, this is a case about a product defect, I represent the plaintiff. Now, I'd like to know how many of you in the panel here deal with written standards in your work. I mean, I see the hands. You deal with any written standards? You deal with written standards? Uh, do you follow them? Is it important to follow them? What happens if you don't follow them? Why do you think they're there? That's what you want to know because if you've got somebody that says, yeah, we got them, we don't follow them, I don't think they mean anything, that's not going to be a good audience. But if somebody says, we have them, if I was to violate the standards my company puts down, I'd probably be walking the sidewalk uh, this afternoon looking in the, uh, you know, classifieds. Now, that's somebody you might want if you've got evidence of violating written standards. So my thinking is, no matter what good point you have, you can get it out without saying it by asking about it, and that's what you want to know because you're looking for the best audience. Does that make sense? I hope it answered your question. <laughs> Thank you, sir. What would you say about, about your evaluation about the status of the practice of law today and where we're going? Well, I'm not going to go there very long because I think we are on a very treacherous, dangerous ground. We have a move afoot to destroy the jury system. I mean, you can't put it any other way. We, it, we, there are forces at work to destroy our jury system. Absolutely do away with it. And when you start doing things like passing caps and saying, doesn't matter what the jury says, this is what you do. Uh, you're not very far from saying, we don't need the jury at all. And if you talk to people, they're talking all the time. Now, we don't need juries in this country anymore. At a time when other countries are moving more to the jury system. But I, I think we really need to get the public's attention, get other people's attention. That, that's one of the reasons, one of the most interesting stories I have to tell, and often when I go give speeches, I just, the speech is telling the story of Bushel's case. Because that's where our tradition in this country of the jury system comes from. It's from those 12 Englishmen in 1670 that would not let the authorities throw William Penn and William Mead in jail just because they happened to be Quakers. Now, you know, the jury system is to prevent the oppression of government, the oppression of big business, the oppression of citizen on citizen. That's what it's all about, is to prevent oppression. And when you start telling People in that case, the judges, you know, they, they had the, uh, the panel of judges, and then they had the jurors, and the judges kept telling them what their verdict ought to be. Well, that's where we're getting to today. They want the legislature now to tell us what the verdict ought to be. My God, who believes that the legislature isn't for sale? I mean, we're going to have people that can be bought and sold like so many commodities, you know, you can buy copper and buy gold, you can buy a legislature. 
We're going to have them telling us what a verdict ought to be. They're to have them tell people what they have a right to. It's scary. So I think as lawyers, we have got to, regardless of our political affiliation, Democrat, Libertarian, Republican, speak out against that and say, you know, it doesn't really matter. We're going to keep the independence of juries, and we are going to keep it where a citizen has a right to go to a jury, and what that jury says is what they get. Right? Getting too far off base? Fight for this. <laughs> the, um, uh, I, I think we all, it's just about time that we uh, close up. Anybody have any more questions or comments or stories that you'd like to share? I think we should all uh, thank Mr. Purdue again for uh, an inspiring presentation. I did have one question. Oh, one more question. I don't think it'll take that long. All right. But I didn't get up earlier. You yes, talked sir. earlier about uh, working in our stories about how to um, focus on how it felt as opposed to describing what happened and how it happened, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and then you also mentioned that we should prepare the jury for that during voir dire, mm -hmm. that we're going to take that position or take, take that method. How do you do that? How do you prepare the jury in voir dire that that's what you're going to do so you don't offend them with too much drama when you get going on your merits? Well, David Ball in his book has uh, some good uh, suggestions on that, and uh, you ought to get his book. It's real good. But David Ball suggests that what you want to do is tell the jury that the only issues are what were the injuries and what were the losses, that that's what they're going to decide. What was the damage? What were the losses? That's the issue. And then you prepare them by saying, in order for me to, to, to show you what the injuries were and what the losses were, we're going to have to talk about what the injuries were and the impact on these people. And so when we talk about that, you understand it's because that is the issue you will be deciding, and there's no way for you to decide it unless you hear that evidence. And that usually gets them going um, it gets them in a frame of mind where they can accept that. See, if you, if you don't do that, and what David Ball suggests, and, and I think it, it's well taken, if you don't do that, what they found is that people will say to the plaintiffs, say, well, I was really with you, and, and, but, and you were really presenting evidence, and of course it's all the evidence on liability, but then you started you know, wanting to appeal to our emotion, talking about how bad it hurt and how bad it felt and all that. So you have to prepare them for that. But if you prepare them for that, then uh, then they can they, they can be receptive to it. We're all uh, every one of us in this room is a work in progress. I mean, we and everybody that's written a book is a work in progress, and we're learning all the time. But as I said with my opening story about Demosthenes, uh, you know, there's a guy that they laughed at when he tried his first cases, and he just decided he wasn't going to be laughed at anymore, and so he started sticking rocks in his mouth and running up and down the hillsides in order to get to be a better speaker. Well, maybe we don't have to stick rocks in our mouths or run up and down hillsides, but there's always things we can do to make us better. Jim Purdue, thank you so much for, for your excellent presentation. Thank you.